Hey everybody, how's it going? Ben Gothard here, and today we have another Project Egg interview, and we're talking with Jordan Miller from North Carolina. How you doing, Jordan? Good, how you doing? Good, fantastic. So let's jump right in, and uh, my first question for you is, what is your story? Oh God. So, it's a really interesting story, actually. Um, where I usually like to start out is, I was a 13, about 12 or 13 year old kid in middle school. And this is kind of where everything began for me because before that, I was a kid with dreams that wanted to do things, but I wouldn't quite do it because I wasn't confident enough. So anyways, about eighth grade, uh, I got jumped, blindsided from like my right side. And um, I went down awkwardly. My right leg shot up, twisted backward, screwed up everything in my knee, my ACL, joints, ligaments, like everything in my knee, like the bone was out and everything. And that happened. School didn't really care whatsoever. So uh, I was immobile for like three months. I was out of school and it was like the most depressing point in my life. My uncle died around the same time who I was close to. And so I was like depressed and suicidal and like attempted suicide once, contemplated it many times. And then at the end of it, um, like there was like a light at the end of the tunnel basically. And I decided to, um, go to the gym with my dad just once. See how I liked it. And so I started going like once and I went two or three times a week. And then like, before I knew it, like I was going to the gym three times a week. I was about 12 and a half, 13 years old when I started going to the gym and I started really getting into it. And, you know, I, my, Depression is something that's hard to get away from, but I was starting to get better with that. I was starting to get a little bit of confidence, and by the time I was 14, I'd build a good bit of muscle. Um, I was a little chubby kid, like I was like five foot three, five foot four, 30 percent body fat, 130 pounds. So I was like one of those little fat kids, like not a big fat kid, like not even the luxury of being a big fat kid, like a little fat kid. So I lost uh, all the fat starting to see abs at about 14 years old. I had some like good definition in my arms and everything. And uh, at 15, I decided to do a, a bodybuilding, a natural bodybuilding show. So I cut down 30 more pounds, got to like, I think it's super shredded because I was only 15, but I got down to like 8% body fat and did a bodybuilding show. And then um, I started helping other people. Um, I just started kind of like writing out meal plans and a little bit of workout routine stuff and then I did two more shows two more bodybuilding shows I think before I was 18 and then uh, I got more serious into things I started a YouTube channel when I was about 17 18 started making like fitness videos kind of fitness tip videos and people kind of like that I, I kind of played around with that I did that for a year um and I kind of felt like I was doing it for the wrong reasons I kind of felt like I was like just doing it I don't, I don't I don't want to say to get attention. I just didn't feel like I was 100% being transparent, being myself. And like, I'm the type of person where I can't do things for money. I can't do things because I think they're cool. I have to feel like I'm doing things because of some deep kind of root down deep that, you know, something that I really, really want to do or something that I really feel like I can help people at. Otherwise it's, you know, wouldn't work out if I was doing it for five or 10 years. Cause if you're sane, and you're doing something that you're not like ridiculously, ridiculously passionate about, and it gets really hard. You know, obviously, you you, you don't keep going. So I quit with that. Crazy. I, I took a completely different direction. Uh, I started getting more into business and film and stuff like that. Uh, and I, I became an actor for four years. And I signed with a talent agency called Evolution Talent Agency. I did about 150 auditions in four years, maybe more. Uh, acting classes every weekend, spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. I learned about cameras, camera angles, kind of how to get better around cameras, uh, how to how to fall into a story better, how people are telling stories, all that sort of stuff. And learning about telling stories and being part of a story and all that stuff is really, really, really helpful. Um, obviously, I didn't become like a full-time paid actor for certain reasons, but uh, just for an idea, not last Super Bowl, but the Super Bowl before, if uh, any of y'all ever saw, saw the uh, commercial where there was like a, someone trying to rob a house and they threw a gnome and then I forget what the football player is, but the guy called it. 
I was supposed to I was supposed to be me, but I got beat out by a guy because he was taller than me, and they wanted someone taller. So literally, um, they liked what I did in the audition so much that they had that guy do what I did in the audition. So what that guy did was how I kind of improvised things. But after a while, I got kind of irritated with the film industry just because you can be a really good actor, you can be really good in an audition room, you can be really good at all these things, but if the director doesn't like your look at that time and they want someone a little taller or a little thinner or whatever, they don't think about the fact that they could kind of change angles and make you look different. They think, oh, this is, you know, let me just pick this person. They'd rather hire someone that has the look more than someone that has the skill set as the actor. So that kind of got irritating. After I kind of got out of that, uh, less passionate about the whole acting thing. I'm, I'm still passionate about acting, just not kind of the process that I was going into it. And I just like the whole creative process of it. That's still very much part of me. But after that, I got, and I haven't told you about any of this stuff, but I got really, really, really into business. Um, I started writing Kindle books. I hired VAs to have other Kindle books. I started a series on Amazon called Versus Heroes, and basically what it was is I was comparing like people that were really, really successful, like uh, Tony Robbins and Napoleon Hill or Arnold Schwarzenegger and um, Dwayne Johnson. People like that, people that were kind of close but in different times. And I was comparing their successes, their failures, their relationships, their personal life, kind of how they've made their brand. That uh, did well for a while, for about a year, and it just never, never really went farther than that. And then... Uh, a good friend of mine, Jason Branch, he actually persuaded me to take my passion for fitness and and put it into Kindle Publishing. So I started writing fitness books. And so I wrote a series. It was early, early last year. Um, it was called Fitness for Women. I wrote five books in that series. That series was uh, pretty, very successful at first, and now it's still kind of mildly successful. And then I wrote two uh, free books after that one about fat loss and one about how to use the app my fitness pal a very popular uh, macronutrient counting apps so right those two free books I use those as lead magnets to get people into my email list and then I decided to write a really really big book and put a lot into it and that book is actually called hashtag gains the dieting encyclopedia and the method behind that book or kind of what I was trying to do is I wanted to write a book that wasn't just talking about one diet or one sort of diet protocol, but I wanted to talk about all of them, even the history of dieting, when it started, how it's changed in the U.S., all that sort of thing, uh, what type of diet would work best for what type of person, psychologically, lifestyle, everything. So I'm not just saying everyone should do one diet or this type of person should do one diet. I'm pointing out all the diets, how they work, how you should do your meals, everything that you could possibly think of any question you could possibly have about any popular diet protocol nowadays and just dissecting it and sort of showing who should use it, who shouldn't, why, and when, and like everything. It's it's huge. It's 100,000 words. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is when I got started in Kindle publishing, um, I got so into reading Kindle books and I was part of so many little communities that were reading Kindle books and so many of them and people were just trying to read as many books a year as they could and there's a lot of book club stuff going on so I came with the idea to uh, sort of have a speed reading app and I did a lot of research on how that how your eyes saccade across a screen or across a piece of paper with words and sort of how that works and how your eyeballs move on words and I had this app all kind of put together and formulated it was going to be called Kindle Line and what I was going to do is sell it to Amazon and have them integrate it with their Kindle book. And so basically, it would be a line that went with the saccading of your eyes and allowed people to read about five times faster within about a month. And just it, it, you would be reading uh, ridiculously faster within a couple of months. Uh, I got really far into that. I had a whole like SWOT analysis done. I had a whole pitch deck, everything you could possibly think of, and went in and pitched it to a board of investors. Uh, they were from different countries. Uh, pretty insane being in a room of billionaires. Uh, I even pitched it to an investor named Jeff Hoffman, the price, the CEO of, I think, it was called Priceline, the flight company. 
Um, that ended up not working out, obviously. It was going to be like over a million dollar deal went through. So that's kind of the history of what I've done up until now. That is now, awesome. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. I missed that last part. What'd you say? Now I'm back on YouTube. Right. Absolutely. Again, with everything that I've learned, everything that I just said, I'm taking it and I put it back on YouTube again. That's great. And it, it's kind of cool how it goes full circle like that. You know, you take the things that you learn and, and you integrate it into to what you're doing now. But I want to dig a little bit more into your past. So you said at 13 years old, that was kind of a, a turning point, if you will. Um, you know, you said you broke your ACL, you, you messed up your knee and, um, you know, your joints and ligaments. What did you learn from that experience that has, you know, now led to um, some of the success that you've had later on in your life? basically that you can take something that's really, really crappy that, that, that kind of makes you think that you're not worth anything. And like that experience at first made me feel like the smallest piece of dirt ever because, uh, these people humiliated me in front of the whole gym class and the gym class didn't care. They just kind of watched me be jumped and like all that sort of stuff. And that was kind of what was worse. Like I, I felt you know, so humiliated with everything and that was what made me depressed and all that sort of stuff. And, but coming out of it, when I decided not to like take my own life, it's just learning that you can bounce back from the most difficult odds, like something that literally takes your identity away. I mean, that was kind of like me, like that was all I knew at that point. It's just like the little poor kid that got jumped that like no one really cares about. And then uh, I bounced back from that and started working out and getting in shape and like became started to become who I am now started to build an identity so sort of what I could take from that or what anyone could take from that is you could have some of the worst things happen to you in life and, and change the whole way you look at things and you can have a choice whether to just give up on everything or not and and those points like you can bounce back and if you can bounce back from that then you can bounce back from anything else because I mean I've Things right now as an entrepreneur are stressful and I get really frustrated sometimes, but like there's nothing that'll ever be as bad as that because I'm just, that was my lowest point. So learning to bounce back from anything would be, would be what I would take from that. Absolutely. And, and I think that's a really good point because, you know, if as entrepreneurs, we let setbacks stop us, you know, if, if we let things stop us dead in our tracks I mean, we can't we can't ever get to that point, uh, get to that light at the end of the tunnel. We can't ever break through to that next level. So, for those who they may be going through tough times right now, or or they may be struggling to overcome a certain obstacle, what advice would you give them to help them bounce back, to help them come back and bring their A game again? Basically, I would just say to hang in there, like whatever you're going through, whatever your circumstances, whatever you think your identity is or how people are looking at you or how society or the world or your parents or your friends or your classmates, if you're in high school or middle school or however your crappy your job is, whatever that thing is, you can change it. And then next year could be completely different and you can be a completely different person and have a different uh, vision of yourself. And basically like your circumstance right now is not you like it's not like everything it's just what you're going through right now and you could take it and and instead of falling off of a cliff like some people do like that happens and it sucks and like I try to help people like that but instead of that happening to you you can take it and bounce back from it as opposed to like letting it consume you and destroy you absolutely absolutely I think that's great advice you know just to just to keep going keep pushing because in the end it'll all be worth it and so, you know, you mentioned after that incident, um, then you went with your dad and you started getting into the gym a little bit more. Uh, could you maybe give a little bit of insight on how, like what you learned from really developing that passion and, and going every day and being consistent with it and, and always showing up? What did you learn from that? And, and what have you now brought to entrepreneurship from that time? So... Fitness is something that I feel like can kind of fall into all areas of your life. When, when you first step in the gym, it's a little intimidating. 
you see like the women that are extremely attractive. You see the guys that are really built and you see people lifting a lot of heavy weight. And if you're a skinnier guy or a fatter guy or a fatter girl, guy, girl, whatever, it, it's, it, it can be really intimidating to that first time to walk in the gym. And like the first couple of workouts can be really discouraging because you're probably going to try to lift more weight than you might be able to do, or you're probably going to try to do more than you think you're going to be able to do because you see other people doing it and it's hard. And so that first week might be really irritating, but then if you stay in there that first week, if you just stay in there that first week and you get into the second week, usually you start seeing like some sort of progress. Like maybe you've gained five pounds on certain lifts or you can do like a couple more minutes on the treadmill or you get less winded or you notice some changes in your face, like your face starts to fill out more, or you're, you're noticing a little bit of muscle growth somewhere in your arm, or, or you lose a little bit of body fat, and you can see those changes. And that first little taste of that is very, very, very rewarding, and it gives you a feeling of confidence, a feeling that like you can improve, you can get a little bit better. And as that relates to entrepreneurship or any other sort of self growth or self development in life, it's about making like small steps every single day and not necessarily get dis getting discouraged because some, some days that you won't make that much change some weeks that you won't jump forward that much. And then like, for instance, you can be working out for three or four weeks, five, six weeks and not make any progress. But then you notice like the seventh or eighth week, all of a sudden you jump forward, like you jump way up. And it's actually all the progress that you've made in the first six to seven weeks, but it didn't really hit off until that seventh or eighth week. And that sort of unlinear progression in the gym is a lot like building a business or entre entrepreneurship in general, just because you can be doing something on a daily basis over and over and over again. And it, what you're doing is good work, but it's just not being seen or you're not making sales or conversions are happening. And then finally something happens and then it happens all at once. And so the sort of number one, how the progression of everything is in the gym is very unlinear. And then number two, just learning the discipline of going in there every day and getting a little bit better every single day. A lot of people, including if you guys know who Ty Lopez is, they talk about how it's not about like, doing like a bunch of crap in one day, like doing as much as you can in one day. It's more about doing something really, really, really intricately every single day. And so it's better to do like 20 minutes at the gym every day and get a good workout than try to go to the gym like once and like hit that two, three hour workout and just destroy yourself and just like, just put everything into that one workout because you won't be able to come back. And the same goes for entrepreneurship if you try to do too much in one day and overwhelm yourself you're just gonna like you're not gonna come back and do it the next day but if you're doing a little bit each day and you're doing that little bit over a two-year period and you have the consistency and the discipline and you get in the habit of doing those things you'll do a lot better so those those are those are a lot of like if you learn how to do that in the gym and you get really good at it it'll fall into all the other areas of your life especially business and entrepreneurship Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think one of the key things that you said was consistency, right? And that kind of goes back to not giving up and you know just being persistent. But if you can every day you show up and you're putting in the time and you know, you're building your business, you're building your assets, you're talking to people, eventually it'll happen, right? And, and for that first one to six weeks, you know, you might not see any sort of progress. You might not see the light at the end of the tunnel. You might not see those seven figures in your bank account. But on that eighth week, dude, when it hits, whoo, it's all going to be worth it. It's all going to be worth it. And so, you know, I challenge everybody that's listening to not worry so much about exactly what results you're getting today from what you're doing today. But think about the culmination of all of the work that you've put in and what that's led to. And think about how much more you can achieve by continuing to consistently put in that work. So, so Jordan, I'm really glad you said that. Now, you also talked about uh, doing a bodybuilding show very early in your fitness career. Could you maybe give a little bit of insight on... Um, I guess the uh, the feelings that you went through kind of going up on, on stage, if you will, for the first time and, and what sort of fear or emotions were uh, were mixed in with that. 
So, as far as doing a bodybuilding show, doing the first bodybuilding show at 15, I don't want to say that I didn't know what I was doing. I had someone helping me, but the diet approach that I went on, like it worked then, but now I would never recommend any client to do it. I, I wouldn't do it myself. What I basically did was go on like a very, very low carb diet, close to zero carb diet for 12 weeks. And because I was starting with pretty decently high body fat, it didn't bother me that bad. But most of the time when you're dieting into a bodybuilding show, you're already in decent shape when you start the diet. Like you're not extremely overweight. You're starting in decent shape because you're, um, you know, in bodybuilding off season conditioning, which to a bodybuilder is fat to a normal person is lean. So you're already starting out in a decent condition, decent shape. Dieting down for a bodybuilding show is a lot harder than people think it is. Like a lot of people think that getting shredded is, uh, it's not that bad and it's not that bad, but when you get to like the last, four weeks or so, you, you, you get irritable because uh, you're leaner than your body wants to be. You're digging into fat stores that your body doesn't want to get rid of because it's not super, super healthy to even be doing that. Uh, your mind starts playing tricks on you. All kinds of things start happening. And so that's when you have to have like either a ridiculous work ethic and a ridiculous discipline or you, you need a coach to keep you on track because otherwise you'll just like go a little bit crazy. But it is worth it. <laughs> what I just said made it kind of sound like it almost might not be worth it. And, like, there will be times when you do that where there are days or uh, just hours or workouts that make you wonder why you're doing it. But then you get to that day um, after you put in all the work in the gym, the posing practice, the dieting, the time in the kitchen, like cooking chicken and egg whites and steaming broccoli and asparagus and all that sort of stuff and then you you actually get on stage and it's like for me um because of all the work that i put in and everything i, I was on stage and like what looks like a man thong in front of like a thousand people watching and i didn't care i wasn't awkward or embarrassed or like nothing like i was just really really like wanting to do well because i'd put in and this is coming from this kid that was so self-conscious when I was 12, 13 that like I, I was I wouldn't even look at people in the face when I talked to them. And, you know, two years later, I'm on stage in front of a thousand people and I don't care. And it's not because I was so like crazy about how my body looked or I was um, conceited or anything like that. It was just like I, I knew I'm confident not because of the way I look. I'm confident because I know what I'm capable of in terms of work ethic, and in terms of what I've already done, and how I can make things happen. Like I don't get I don't get confidence from the way I look. I get confidence from my work ethic. So, because of all that that I'd done, uh, I wasn't that same little kid that like couldn't stand to have a shirt off in front of people. I was someone that had a lot of confidence in what I was capable of. So on stage, I just wanted to to show that to the judges and the audience and kind of like display the amount of work that I'd put in since I was 13 and the 12 to 13 week diet that I like went through and like, you know, taken so much sacrifice from. And so I, it was, a, it, it was a great experience. The first bodybuilding show, I think for anybody watching that wants to do a bodybuilding show, if you're anywhere from 14 to 18, I'd recommend not doing one yet just because you should be growing until you're about 20. But at that point, like, it's a good experience to have, not just to go out there and try to win, but just to, just to have the experience on, under your belt of learning how to diet down and getting on stage and just the whole thing. Just just the discipline of all of it, it, it teaches you a lot because you have to make a lot of sacrifices. You can't go out and eat with your friends as much. Uh, there are certain things that you can't do. It, it, you know, you have to be, you, you have to hit your workouts, you know, if you want to get to where you want to go, or you will in the back of your head harbor the thought that like, I might have looked just a little bit better if I would have stayed on my diet this day, or if I would have hit this workout. Granted, if you're sick, you're sick, but you know, it, it really comes down to you. Bodybuilding is a selfish sport. Uh, if you even want to call it a sport, like you don't have teammates, you don't have any of that. It's all about you, your diet, your workouts every single day. So when you get on stage, you don't really think about people looking at you or what you look like or anything. You just kind of think about, like, I put in all this work, so now I want to display it and see what comes of it and kind of look back and see what this day was like. Absolutely. And I, I think 
I think that 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 is a really good point. And you actually brought up two that I want to touch on, uh, and and the first is discipline. I mean, you said that hitting your workouts every day, making sure you stay on that diet every day, and being consistent with it, it teaches you discipline. And I think as entrepreneurs, we have to have discipline in order to become successful. I mean, we have to have discipline in, in our in the amount of work that we do, right? Are we going to put in the work every single day? Are we going to continuously learn? Are we going to keep reading? Are, are we going to keep educating ourselves? Are we going to have the discipline to say, okay, I want to go out and I want to have a fun time with my friends on Friday, but I'm not going to because I know that I need to work on this client proposal, or I know I need to film this video, or I know I need to write this book. And so in order to get from where we are to where we want to be, that's going to take an extraordinary amount of discipline, and I'm really glad you brought that up. But the second point is when you talked about get having confidence, and having confidence not from the appearance, right, not from how you look, but having confidence from the amount of work that you put in and, and, and your work ethic. And so maybe you could touch a little bit more on that um, and, and why it's so important that as entrepreneurs we don't, we don't value so much what we look like or, or what people think of us, but we value the work that we put in. Maybe you could give a little bit more insight on that. Well, what you look like is going to change and what you look like really doesn't have that much to do with your work ethic or any of that. And different people are going to have different perceptions of you based off of their own life and their own beliefs and what they're going through and their level of confidence and where they're at in life. So if you use um, what you look like or what other people think of you or, or what other people think that you're doing, any of those outside things, then you're not going to really be uh, accurately gauging yourself or your performance or how good you can be or, or how far you can go because you're just going to be taking what other people think and, and other people's perceptions of you, which aren't you like on YouTube, you make a YouTube video that you spend 12 hours in, you know, you spend like a couple hours creating the content. You spend a couple hours marketing it. You spend a lot of time editing it. That's where most of the time comes in. You can spend all that time and people are still going to post really messed up comments that have, no relevance whatsoever just because they're trolling on you so you can't worry about what people think because a lot of people like don't even like they're just out of their minds in the first place they're just kind of trolling and then other people they have very very skewed perceptions of you because of how their own life is going so if you have confidence and you view yourself based off of your own work ethic and what you went through then you're going to keep working that hard because you see where you've gotten from the amount of work that you put in. Like it's, it's, there are some times where you can't see the progress. Like you can't see how things are moving and you can't really appreciate things. And like you lose a little bit of gratitude because you're so like, uh, in depth in the grind. Sometimes you just kind of have to look back and look at how many days you've put in, how much you've, you've accomplished. Even if you haven't like, had this enormous success and aren't making like 10 grand a month yet or aren't like like a celebrity or anything like Ty Lopez. Even, like, even if you're not like that yet, and that takes a long, like those guys work for so much longer than we actually know before anything happens. But if you're looking at sort of your, your track record, how disciplined are you are, how consistent you've been, how much work you've put in, you're going to feel a lot better about what you're doing and where you're going than if you just kind of look at what people think of you, uh, what people look at your work. Like, you know, for me, I make YouTube videos sometimes that that I spend eight hours on and then they bomb out and, like, don't even hit 100 views in the first 24 hours, which really irritates me. And it's irritating to spend 12 hours on something and then, like, not get a lot of recognition for it or to, like, build a program or build something up that you put a lot of time and effort in. You know it's good, but people just aren't seeing it because of – whatever reason so if you value the work you put into it and all that sort of stuff more than you value how the market is reacting currently or how other people perceive you or how it looks then you're going to value yourself a lot more and you're going to move forward a lot easier than if you look at things from um, a little skewed perception of you know other people how other people judge you how other people look at you and 
just the appearance of everything. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I really like what you said about, you know, you valuing it more and, and recognizing the time and effort that you put in more than what other people think about it. And I think that there is a fine line, right? Because at some point, your customers, their perception of it, that does have to matter, right? Yep. And so we always have to keep in mind uh, when when we're selling something that we have to make sure that it's fine-tuned to our customers. But I think to the point that, that you were trying to make is if you've already put in this effort and you've already you've done the work that you need to do and you know that it's a good product, then believe in it and believe in yourself and just keep pushing through because sometimes it does take a little while to get some, some market penetration and, and it does take a little while to get it into the right people's hands to where it'll spread. And, you know, a prime example of that is um, J.K. Rowling. You know, she was the author of the Harry Potter series. And when she first published or was trying to get published that first book, she was homeless in her car. And she had nothing. I mean, she had kids. She was a single mother. She had kids. And she just kept pushing and kept pushing and kept trying to get it published. And now she's worth billions and she's one of the wealthiest people if not the wealthiest person in England so you know it just goes to show you if you put in that work and you put in that effort and you believe in yourself and you have the confidence that what you have to offer is strong then go for it I mean don't don't ever hold back don't don't ever don't ever lack that confidence just because of what's happening right now. See what can happen in the in the future. So I'm really glad that you brought up that point. That, that was a really good point. Now, one thing you mentioned was once you started doing the bodybuilding stuff, uh, you started to, to help others. Um, could you, one, give a little bit more insight on how you helped, maybe did some coaching or, or, or fitness training, um, a little bit on how you helped and why helping others is important as an entrepreneur? So I think a lot of people can relate to this, but when I started helping others, uh, I wasn't doing it to make money. Like, I don't even think I charged the first couple of times that I made diet plans or workout routines. I was just, uh, helping friends. Like, so that's the same thing that someone did for me when I was 15, someone that had already done a couple of bodybuilding shows and placed well actually helped me and wrote a diet plan and a workout routine and all that sort of stuff. So uh, after I learned how to do everything and I felt like I was pretty good at it and I, I had some good skills on my belt, naturally about 16, 17, uh, I wanted to start helping other people just so it kind of reaffirms that you know what you're doing when you can see see the progress in other people. It's one thing for something to work for you, but it's another thing for something to work over and over again for other people. Uh, a lot of people talk about it, but you could do something good once and that's cool. But if you do something good over and over and over again, then, then it's going to reaffirm to you and it's going to reaffirm to other people that it works and, and, and it clearly works. And not only that, but one of the reasons I like working with people and helping people is it just, it, it makes you feel really good. Like if you can, if you actually, and, and you're not doing it to make money, but you're actually doing it to help people, it, it makes you feel really really good it's a good feeling i don't know if any of you guys have gotten to that point yet but if you have you understand the kind of feeling you get when you're helping somebody and they make progress and if you haven't just know that it does feel really good and it is worth it so getting started with that stuff basically i just had people coming up to me asking me like how i did some stuff and then they were kind of wanting to do I didn't coach anyone into a bodybuilding show. I was just helping people get leaner, build a little bit of muscle, get bigger arms, you know, get stronger on squat or bench or deadlift or things like that. And so I was just helping people like that. I did that for a couple of years. And I think when I was about like 18, 19 is when I started calling it online coaching, turned it into online coaching. Before that, I was just basically like helping people around here. And it wasn't online. I think 19, 20 was when I actually put together a website and started having it as something you could purchase. Before, I was just like taking cash in hand. And so 
started out as me helping a couple of people and then from there uh, I started charging a little bit like anywhere between 30 and 50 dollars for a diet plan or you know 50 dollars for a work, workout routine and then you know developed a website went from there and yeah that's about everything in a nutshell it feels really good to help people number one number two if you're helping people and they succeed then it solidifies that this doesn't only work for you, this process that you've created, but that it works for multiple people. So if it works over and over again for multiple different types of people, then it, it obviously works. So you've solidified that it works. It makes you feel really good. And you've started kind of from here with this process and you've built on it and built on it and built on it until it's became like a premium paid service. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, just to kind of to kind of touch on what you said a little bit about helping people and, and how it makes you feel. You know, I, I, I mentor a few people um, in, in various different different uh, ways, whether it be marketing or entrepreneurship or, or personal development. Um, but when you, when you can take what you've learned and you can instill those principles into somebody who's just getting started and, and, and you can see exactly where they are on the spectrum because you were just there you know you were just there a few years ago and you can help them cut down that learning curve and, and reach success more quickly I mean that really is a beautiful thing and yeah. and it, it not only does it make you feel really good on the inside but like you said it, it, it reaffirms everything that you're doing because you know okay well I got here this way now I'm gonna give this to you and look how far you've gone in that in a shorter amount of time you know that that is a really a really powerful tool because they say that the best way to learn something is actually to teach it and obviously you need to go out and do it and get experience and you need to know what you're teaching but it, it not only helps you solidify again those concepts but your students will actually teach you a lot too um, yeah. and, and uh, yeah you, you wanna uh, you wanna maybe touch on that a little bit oh gosh I have I have a lot of different clients like so I have some clients that it's very smooth and they do the diet, they do the workout routine, and everything is really smooth. I have other clients that they will start to do things and they will tell me they don't like dieting and they will want to stop. I have other clients that um, they tell me they want a workout routine and then I build it and then they tell me, never mind, they want to stick on their own workout routine. So you learn about different types of people. You definitely learn patience just because I'm a certain way. I've actually been coached before by some of the top coaches in the U.S., uh, Team 3DMJ, Jeff Alberts. They, they are literally the top, some of the top natural bodybuilding coaches in the U.S., and they coached me into a show once. And I was the type of person that whatever they told me to do, I would do it 100%. I had nightmares about screwing up my diet. Like, that was how bad I was. Like, I had bad dreams that I would eat too much one day, like, that I would screw up, like, by minute macronutrient numbers. That was how I was. And so that got me thinking that would how it, that would how it was going to be. Like, it would be like that when I coach people. And so it's not like that at all. <laughs> not not no one – no one's like that. Like, hardly anyone's like that. Most people are quite the opposite – you have to make sure that they're on track. Uh, you're holding them accountable for certain things, for their diet, for their workout routine. And some people are easier to work with than other people. Um, but mostly what you learn is just to be patient because some people are going to be like problem children and they're going to be like really irritating, really, really irritating. And you're going to like think like, why, why am I even helping you because you're not like, doing anything that I've created or you're not like listening to anything that I'm saying. And then, you know, sometimes you can actually get those people where they want to be. Sometimes you have to like really kind of go back and forth to figure out what's going to work with those people psychologically, because people that are hard to deal with, I've found it's more because they're used to their routine. They're used to what they're already eating they're used to the way they're already eating. They're used to the meal, like the times they're already eating. They're used to their current workout split or they don't have one and they're having trouble adhering to one. It's usually those people that, that, that are, uh, they don't like change. Those are the ones that, that are hard to 
they're hard pressed to move them and move them forward and like create change. And then the people that are kind of really, really open people like open books, they're really easy to work with. So you're going to have to like learn what kind of client you have early on and then know what you're getting into and work with them according to that. If they're a really, really open person and they're ready to do something or if they're like, ah, and they're not really, it's like, sure. They're kind of like fighting back against things. So once you kind of learn what type of client you have and how to go about it, it makes things a lot easier as opposed to just kind of going in expecting them to do exactly what you want them to do. Cause that doesn't always happen. Absolutely. And, you know, I think at the core of, of what you're saying is um, is a, a need for, for people skills and a need yeah. to develop a way to not only deal with people individually, but be able to recognize that certain people are representative of, of you know, certain types of, of learners and certain types of workers. And, um, you know, you have to pick apart exactly who it is that you're helping and what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and how your strengths and weaknesses play off of that. So I'm, you know, I'm really glad you said that. Um, but beyond just the capacity of a, a mentor and mentee relationship, how else have or has people skills been instrumental to your success as an entrepreneur? Uh, it's I've had a lot of sales jobs just just to kind of get by like being an entrepreneur there have been times where i'd have to go get a day job for like four months just to like get some money and obviously i don't tell the people that are hiring me that i'm probably not going to be here very long but i just do it long enough to save up money so that i can go back to like making the small amount of money that i make as an entrepreneur sometimes and like have that money to kind of like put into it and not like get too scared and so Having sales skills as an entrepreneur, uh, uh, <laughs> tongue tied. Having sales skills as an entrepreneur is helpful for one reason because uh, there may be times where you have to get a job for like a month and make money. And if you have sales skills and you can get a sales job, it's really easy to make a lot of money really, really quickly and be able to just kind of do that, save it up, and go back to the grind. Uh, that's helped me a lot. But just in general, as an entrepreneur, you're always going to be a salesman like you're always a salesman that's like that's that's what you do and even if like I, I think people are born with certain things they're really good at um, for me specifically like I was I don't think I was born to be a salesman like, like if I had to guess what I was like I would say that I'm a creative I'm like really good at creating things like really good at creating abstract things and, and then making them into something that can help people I can sell things but I'm not like the number one salesman in the world. Like there are people that could sell you anything. Like it's ridiculous. I'm not one of those people, but cultivating the skills as a people person and someone that, that communicates well and communication, I would say is the number one part of sales. Like the number one piece of, of being good at, at getting your point across to people. Because if you can't communicate well to people, they're not going to understand what the heck you're talking about because like you're an insider on whatever it is that you're selling the person you're selling it to may not be an insider. Sometimes they are, but most of the time they're not. So you have to take your knowledge of the product or your knowledge of whatever it is, your product or your service or anything that you're trying to sell and simplify it to a point where it makes sense for that person that your, uh, your client, your, whoever it is you're selling it to and word it in a way that, make sense for their circumstance for their life kind of understand who they are as a person you know get to know them a little bit what's their name do they have kids where do they live you know what are they into what are their hobbies like whatever you can learn from this person and then once you kind of know them a little bit you can kind of word things in a way that oh okay well i know that you like to do all this type of stuff well this could help you in this area and this area and like now you don't really feel like you're pushing like when you just kind of like try to sell something to someone without really understanding why they might need it or how it might help them, you're going to come across very salesy, like a salesman, and they're not going to like that. And it's going to like, they're going to, they're going to feel like you're a car salesman <laughs> and not all, and not all car salesmen are like car salesmen, but like the, the classic car salesman is someone that just kind of like walks up to someone and tries to like 
close before they know the person. And I think that's where they have that kind of bad, uh, bad energy towards them. So not doing that, but instead getting to know someone and understanding what you're selling them on and, and getting to know them a little bit better. And then now, now you're not really a salesman to them. You're someone that's helping them get where they need to go. So people's skills are important because of that, because you're helping someone as opposed to selling someone. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, I think you're, you're right on the money with that. Um, so, you know, you talked about how one of the things that, um, that you do is you put up videos on YouTube and you bring in from your, from your acting career and, and, um, you put everything on YouTube. Could you maybe give a little bit more information on what you're doing on YouTube and, and, um, some of the, just more on, on that? So, Basically, what I am on YouTube uh, as a title is I am a fitness blogger. So typically, I have the camera. Actually, the camera's in the other room right now, so I'm not going to get it. But the tripod that my phone is sitting on to do this interview is the tripod that my camera usually sits on. And I just hold it out like this. It actually, the tripod, it can bend in any sort of way. So it allows you to like have the camera farther away from you. Uh, you can hold it up a little bit easier. Uh, you won't drop it as easily. But basically, uh, people think when I say that I'm on YouTube and they know I'm into fitness, they say, oh, you, so you make workout videos. And I'm like, no. Like, that's, that's, that's what people always say. Like, if you are a fitness YouTuber, people are always going to say, always going to say, so you make workout videos. Not really. Basically, what I do is just like acting, just like a movie. Basically, what uh, a movie is is uh, it's highlights. You're taking a story, you're taking someone's life, uh, you're taking a really good story, and then you're helping, you, you're taking all these actors that are going to be part of the story. Actors are not storytellers, they're pieces of the story. So if anyone is an actor and ever says they're a storyteller, they're not a very good actor because they're saying that, they don't know what acting is. Uh, anyways, YouTube is a lot like um, movies, just because of the fact that a movie is little pieces of uh, highlights of life, like one after the other, that go to a story. Um, I look at YouTube a lot as the same way. I'm not just going to pick the camera up and just kind of like go downstairs as I make my coffee in the morning and just kind of like slowly talk to the camera. What I'm going to do is think of like what are the highlights that are going to happen today and like how can I angle the camera to, to catch them in a good way and then how can I fit in little pieces of me talking about certain things and what, what, what is it that I want to talk about today. So basically, um, as a fitness YouTube blogger, I'll have certain things that are on my mind every day, certain things that I want to talk about. And then obviously I'm going to be doing a little bit different things every single day. And so I take what I'm doing and basically turn it into highlights. And that's kind of how a vlog is. You kind of see the highlights of a day and it cuts and it cuts and it cuts and it cuts. And, it cuts. and uh, so you'll have, kind of what I'm doing before my workout, me talking different little pieces of my day. Uh, I try to make sure that it's appealing looking the way that I film it. I, I try to like be very, very um, smooth with the camera. When I'm holding it, I've learned to like move it smoothly whenever I'm walking. I've learned to kind of like move with my footsteps so that that way it looks a little bit more stabilized. All that gets put together into sort of like a story every day. Um, and I, I did do daily uploads for about 160 days. Uh, after a while, it just got to a point where I felt like I was kind of being held down, that I couldn't do as much as I wanted to because I was only working with one day. Uh, and it was killing creativity just a little bit. So I dialed it back to every other day. So basically what I'm doing right now is every other day I'm doing a fitness uh, vlog. And the topic could be about anything. Um, yesterday's video was actually called why 98% of people will never get shredded. And I say that because most people that want to get shredded, they don't know exactly how hard it is to get like bodybuilding stage lean shredded 4% body fat. And most people that go into it fail, but people don't talk about that because people don't want to hear about that. They want to hear only the success stories. So I make videos uh, about anything that I could think of that could help people basically. And I turn them into a vlog. And so you have you have a little bit of me kind of talking to the camera, a little bit of what I'm doing that day in a way that's interesting. 
and then you have a workout. So my workouts are in my videos about every day, and that's sort of like the center of the video. I don't make workout videos, but my workouts are part of my days. Like sometimes I won't even have a workout in a video, but 75 to 80% of the time I have a workout in a video. And basically what I'll do, like my kind of how I do things is I'll film all day and then take my SD card out of my camera, put it in my computer, do a little bit of editing, save the render file, and then film all day the next day and then take that footage, take the SD card out, put it into the editing uh, software, and then I'll put together a video, and the next day I'll publish it. So that's sort of my schedule for making videos. And yeah, any any do you have any more questions about kind of how I film videos? or? Um, I mean, if, if you have any really good tips or, or uh, maybe anecdotes about, about you know, filming and, and anything that could help entrepreneurs who might just want to be um, starting on their YouTube journey or, or anything like that, then that, I think that'd be a good thing. To Best thing to say is that like in any market on YouTube, there, there are going to be a ton of people. Um, in my market specifically, there are a ton of people that are trying to make fitness vlogs or fitness videos, and I can watch like 30 of them and they all feel the same. So you need to get good with the camera. Um, when you first pick up the camera, it's going to feel awkward. You're going to stutter a lot just because it doesn't feel natural like whatsoever. And when you do things like that, it comes across as ingenuine or your audience feels like it, it, it just gives a bad vibe. So getting better at that stuff, number one, like that should be the first act of duty. And then number two, making sure that your videos are interesting because you could be talking about something like I, I could be talking about fat loss and be very, very boring. It could be the same topic, and then some, someone else could come in and talk about it and be a very interesting person with a really funny voice, and like their cuts could be really good on the video, and, and it could just be a much better video on the same topic. So the ways that I like to make things interesting, depending on what you're doing, if you're just doing a small sales video, it could just be you talking to the camera with like some b-roll footage and basically what b-roll footage is is you're taking video of other things other than you that are aesthetically appealing and you're playing it over you talking so that way you don't have to like sit and watch like five to ten minutes of you talking straight to the camera because people will click off of a video like if you're if you're just doing uh just talking to the camera and it's really boring uh, unless you're like a really funny person and you're really loud and obnoxious then you might not have to do b-roll footage but that that's just if you're doing like a straight sales video where you're just talking to the camera. I don't do that many videos like that. Most of my videos are like me throughout the day. And the way I do it, since my videos are more set up like a vlog, is if I want to talk about something or there's something that I'm trying to sell, I'll just randomly place it in the video. And it's very nonchalant. It doesn't seem like that's what the video is about. And at that point, I'll place a live card in the video. And so right when that happens, you can just click it and go straight to it just from the screen. Um, and then again, it, it really depends on what type of videos that you're trying to do. Figure out if you want to be a vlogger or if you want to make little short informative videos that are more like just you talking to the camera with B-roll footage or what it is that you're trying to kind of convey to your audience. And then two things that make or break people that like I don't think they should be a big deal, but YouTube's decided they are a big deal is your thumbnail. So your picture, your picture thumbnail. Like that's number one, and then number two is your title. Um, your title, if your title's not good, no one's ever gonna click it. And people call it clickbait, but I don't call it clickbait. I say if it's in your video and it's something that your video is about, and you could word it in a way that's gonna intrigue people to want to know more about what it is you're talking about, put that in the title. But it has to be something that is gonna garner clicks, because like it, it, like so. For, for instance, if I'm trying to uh, make a video about bench press and I want people to click it and learn about bench press, I wouldn't title my video um, bench press better or how to bench press better. I would title my video something like 98% of people don't know this about bench press or this is something something 98% of you are doing wrong or something intriguing like you don't have to use 98% or a statistic but use something that's going to be like oh that like that interests me as opposed to just something bland 
uh, if you make it a question, a lot of times it's going to make it a question or sort of like an exclamation or something that people aren't doing or something that people don't know or uh, using using secret is kind of cliche at this point, but that can work too. And so having a good catchy title and a good catchy thumbnail. And then one thing that YouTube's changed recently that a lot of people don't know is your keywords only work depending on what you say in the video. So if you keyword your video up with things that you think might re be relevant, but you didn't say any of those things in the video, they're not going to rank like any of them. So none of those things are going to like, you know, be clickable to your video. Um, if you have a video with no words, then a little bit different. But if you have a video where you're talking, you want to make sure that you're saying certain things, you're putting certain things in there, and then you're tagging those certain things to get to the video. Absolutely. And it, and it seems like, you know, all these things come together to really say that you have to be genuine. Yep. And, you know, with your with your title, it has to the title has to relate to what you talk about in your video and your tags, which is the keywords that's how people find you. That has to be things that you actually talk about in the video. And and you know, I, I so I really like what you said there, and, and I really do appreciate the value that um, you know that you're adding to the to this interview. So, uh, you know, I just I have a, a few more questions for you. Um, this has been a great interview so far, by the way. I really do appreciate your time. Um, but as as entrepreneurs. You know, we always need to learn. We always need to better ourselves. We always need to develop. What books would you say are the ones that have been the most impactful to you on your entrepreneurial journey? First book that I ever came about, which I feel like a lot of people have this as their first book because it's like a thing, but Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, that was – one of the first things that I came about, there was like a series that I just kind of randomly found on YouTube. It was like the, I don't know how many principles that it was, but it was like so many principles that Napoleon Hill had. And they just kind of take it, they took it out of the book and just put it into principles. And he actually did, I didn't know this, but Napoleon Hill did a, vi a video interview that was kind of talking directly about the principles. And that kind of turned me on to like the law of attraction type of stuff, which is something that I've been trying to like get back to here lately. Um, but, uh, the law of attraction, Abram Hicks, really, really good book. Just because if, if you don't pay attention to that stuff or you don't know that stuff and you're ever thinking about what's wrong in your life or, or what's bad and you're focusing on that stuff and you're wondering why like more bad things happen, then it, it's kind of good to learn about, uh, attraction and law of attraction and all that sort of things. And then any book that has to do with your mindset, because at the end of the day, it's all going to come down to like how you're thinking about things because if you're focusing on like what's going wrong, then you're, you're not going to be very passionate. It's going to drain your passion. You're going to like want to give up a lot easier where as opposed to if you're just kind of as hard as it sounds to do, like it's easier said than done brushing the bad things off your shoulders and focusing on things that you're trying to do and the mission and the, and the goals and everything and so, sort of what is working, uh, it makes life a lot easier. So anything Napoleon Hill, I absolutely love. Most of Abram Hicks stuff, I absolutely love. She's written a couple of books. Like she's written a book about um, specifically Law of Attraction that became famous. They made a, a little documentary on it, which is really cheesy. Uh, there's also like another book that she wrote called like The Law of Love or something like that. And then there's another one that she had written that was actually like a daily kind of Law of Attraction quote. And I've, I've got all of them. I thought they were really all great books. Uh, I think a lot of people get the law of attraction wrong because they think you can just think things in your life and then be lazy. But it's like, think positive thoughts, think about things that are going to help you, and then also do the work. So that's where Tony Robbins comes in. Uh, Tony Robbins is another person that I like to read a lot of his books. He's got books on financial success. He's got books on uh, being better mindset-wise. So Tony Robbins, uh, Abram Hicks, uh, Napoleon Hill, uh, what is the guy's name? Dale. What is his name? Dale, Dale Carnegie. Car yeah, so Dale Carnegie. I think my absolute favorite favorite book for business is uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I, I would like I've read that book like ten times, and almost every time I write an email or like write something to someone, I'll go back and like look. I'll go back and listen to his part about how companies should write email or how how they should write letters, because I think. A lot of people, when they're writing a proposal or writing a job interview, a letter, or any of those things, writing to someone they want to partner with, they talk too much about themselves. 
or how they're going to help them. And they're not talking about what the other person wants or what they could get out of it. And, and that should be backwards. And you should start out your email or start out whatever it is you're proposing, like as what they want, like what they're going to get out of it, how they're going to grow. If you're talking about yourself at all, it should be what you're going to do for them. And maybe at the end of it, you could mention your credentials a little bit because that, that people like that a lot better as opposed to like if you mention how great you are and your credentials and how awesome you are. And then at the end of it, you mention a little bit of what you're going to do for them. Like most likely that'll never work. You'll never get with investors. You'll never partner with anybody. You'll never like kind of win anybody over that way. So for that reason, I really like Dale Carnegie. Um, Napoleon Hill just kind of started me on the whole like journey of self-help like napoleon hill was the first person that i started reading from another great book by napoleon hill that i love i don't know if you've read this but how to out with the devil freaking awesome book uh i've not actually um read that one but all the all the authors that that you mentioned are, are spectacular i mean they really are impactful and intelligent and really really strong people to to follow so you know i do want to thank you for uh for bringing that up and um, you know, I just uh, I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, about your course because uh, you know we've spoken a little bit lately about you actually releasing a full fitness course. Am I am I correct in that? Maybe you could yeah. give a little bit of insight on what it is, um, what you put into it, and how much it's helped people. So there are a lot of sort of I don't know how to call them, like workout plans out there. If you've heard of like P90X or MP45 or Insanity, those were kind of like classic examples of um, workout plans. Some of them used to come with CDs. Um, what I noticed is with online coaching and macronutrients and all the stuff that I teach, there was not a program that was based off of, of those principles. So I wanted to make a program – that, that was a little bit longer than some. A lot of the programs are too short these days. They're like 30 days, 45 days, 50 days. I don't think you can really make lasting change with that. I think you could get shredded, or not get shredded, but you could lose some weight to go to the beach in 30 days. Like maybe lose 10 pounds. But it's not gonna like it's not gonna change your lifestyle. So what I wanted to do is take what I've learned for dieting, take what I've learned with, with training, take what I've learned with helping all the clients that I've worked with over time and put together something that could do all that without me being part of the equation. So basically a program that's sort of like a coach without having an actual coach. So what the program does is number one, it's a 100 day program. It's a 100 day powerlifting slash bodybuilding program that teaches you how to Start out as a powerlifter, start out as a bodybuilder, and I'm not saying that you need to be a powerlifter or a bodybuilder, but most of the time when people go to the gym, they want to gain strength, get stronger on core lifts, which is powerlifters are the best at doing that. So I use their methodology, not that you need to be a powerlifter, but also put in bodybuilding because bodybuilders have the best knowledge to do the best on building muscle. So you have powerlifting and bodybuilding progression styles that you're going to learn how to do. Uh, you're going to learn how to do that over 100 days, going to get better and better at it. I also implement deloads, and how that works is one thing that people don't think about and a lot of reasons that, that people plateau out is because when you're building muscle and building strength, what happens is the first week is going to be sort of intense. The second week is going to be a little bit more intense. The third week is going to be usually really intense. This is on a progression scheme, and you build a little bit of muscle around that time, but when you really build the most muscle is when you take a week easy. And what I call those are deload weeks. And a lot of people don't do those, so they, they leave a lot on the table and they plateau out. Because if you go hard week after week after week after week and you don't deload, then your body really can't recover and bounce back. And, I mean, I talked about bouncing back earlier in the video. Uh, your body has to have that recovery week to bounce back. Building muscle is almost like a rubber band. It's almost like you stretch it, you stretch it, you stretch it, you beat yourself up, beat yourself up, beat yourself up for a couple of weeks, and then you take that week and deload. And what the deload week is, you take off 20% off the weights, you take off a couple of sets off of every exercise, uh, you go easy on your joints, your ligaments, your central nervous system, and then you come back again and get a lot stronger, you build muscle, 
you don't stagnate out. Uh, that's just part of the program, though. It also teaches you how to count macronutrients, macronutrients being carbs, fat, and protein. There are a lot of different ways to diet. That's what I talk about in the book, Hashtag Gains. But if you're trying to get into really, really good shape, like you're trying to get shredded or build a good bit of muscle in a short period of time, it's really good to learn like the numbers. So the fat, carbon, protein is what food breaks down into. And you, you can do meal plans. You can do intuitive eating. But if you're counting macros, it's very, very specific, and it's more flexible. If you're counting macros, you can fit in a donut here and there. Like you can do it, and you can still get lean because you're counting the numbers, not the food. So basically it starts out and it calculates your macros based off of your gender, your career type, your age, your height. Like everything is taken into account. It will calculate your macros. And you can do this program in three ways. You can do it to get shredded. You can do it to kind of like just gain strength and kind of maintain the way you look and just kind of what's called recomp or just – not change your body weight that much, but build more muscle and get a thicker look. Or you can do it to bulk up and gain a good bit of muscle in 100 days. So it's not a program for shredding or a program for building muscle. It's a program for doing whatever. Like you can you can customize it to whatever you want to do, depending on how your macros are. But that's what's going to change everything. Uh, contrary to popular belief, you really don't need to change your workouts to get shredded or to build muscle. It's your diet that that influences what you do if you're eating a certain amount of food you're going to gain weight if you're eating a certain amount of food you're going to maintain if you're eating a certain amount of food you're going to cut down so every single week um it's going to have directions to change things so it's going to say okay if you're here then change your macros to here and this is something the program does on its own i don't know any other program that does that so like week two week three you're not losing any weight it's going to say okay change your fat to here and if then you drop, then, all right, good. Next week, you don't have to make any changes. And that's usually what an online coach does. But the program teaches you how to do it yourself. Um, the progression scheme on the workouts sort of do the same thing. So not only is it a program where you can build a lot of muscle or get shredded or build a lot of strength or one of, the, you know, all three of them in 100 days, but you learn how to progress in your strength. You learn how to progress in building muscle you learn how to shred down if you want to. You learn how to go through a bulk cycle if you want to. You can do it multiple times. You can do it once to get shredded and do it another time to bulk up. Uh, you learn how to use progression. One of the things that a lot of people don't do is go in the gym on an actual progression scheme. What a progression scheme is is something that allows you to get a little bit better each week. So maybe you have a certain rep scheme on a lift. You're starting out with a certain amount of reps and the second week and third week, you drop a rep, drop a rep, go up five pounds, go up five pounds. That's what a progression scheme is. And basically the program has a progression scheme for bodybuilding progression scheme for powerlifting. And the two actually do correlate because as you get stronger, you're going to open up the window to build more muscle. And as you build more muscle, you're going to open up the window to get stronger because you can only get so strong at a certain amount of muscle mass. Basically, what happens as you gain strength is your muscle, uh, your body, everything is adhering to the movements. You're adapting to the motor pattern. Once your body becomes fully adapted to the motor pattern and you can't force any strength out, any more strength out of that amount of muscle that you have, you have to build a little bit more muscle to get a little bit stronger. And the opposite is when you're building strength, it's going to help you build more muscle because – if you're benching 45 pounds on the bench press, you're bench pressing the bar for 10 reps. You know, you want to get stronger so that you can eventually bench 135 for 10 reps. And maybe you're only bench pressing 135 for a couple reps right now, but you have to do those low reps in order to be able to do that same weight for high reps. Um, doing volume, doing a lot more volumes, and doing a lot more sets and a lot more reps is what builds muscle. But in order to actually build the muscle, you actually have to be lifting a good bit of weight for a good bit of volume. Uh, so everything sort of fits together to build muscle, to get shredded, to get stronger, to learn how to count macros. And at the end of the day, I wanted to build a program that taught all the principles that I teach people uh, without actually needing me. And so that's basically what Alpha 100 is. is it's a program that gets you in really good shape in 100 days at the same time teaches you powerlifting, bodybuilding progression, and teaches you how to count macros uh, at a base level. And so I've actually got a MyFitnessPal guide in the book. Um, 
hashtag gains is actually on a PDF. So it's not the actual book, but it's a PDF version of the book. So that's part of it. So you get that as well. So everything as far as dieting, you learn about you learn about how to count macros. You learn about how to use the app, like down to the T, how to how to use the app to count macros. Like everything is there. Um, I just I didn't see anyone else doing that, and I felt like people needed that because some people they don't want a coach or they don't need a coach. They just need to learn the things that are out there that they don't understand. And so. Uh, I wanted to put that out there. One other thing that I failed to mention is there is a uh, basically a weight loss myths guide at the end of the the PDF version of hashtag gains that I, I think is really valuable because there are a lot of myths out there that people believe that hold them back. Like you can't eat carbs at bedtime or you'll get fat or you can't skip breakfast. Those are two myths or, or that there's an anabolic window after a workout. And if you don't use the anabolic window, you'll lose muscle. That's also a myth. You don't need protein right after you work out. You won't lose muscle. So I've got 21 of those myths that I debunk at the end of the book. So you've got all the myths debunked that you probably believe right now that are holding you back. You'll learn how to count macronutrients for the rest of your life. Uh, you'll learn how to use bodybuilding and powerlifting progression. And overall, you'll just kind of be abducted into the fitness lifestyle with the program. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, I'm actually going to put a link down in the description below. Uh, where you can go and grab Jordan's book, Gains, hashtag Gains, and you can also take a peek at the course as well. So that, again, it's going to be in the description below. Uh, I very highly encourage everybody that's listening to go check those things out. Jordan's really put a lot of time and effort into this. As you can see, he not only preaches these things, but he lives it. Um, not only is he swole, but he uh, he's also a great guy, and, and you can learn a lot from him. So, Jordan, I do want to thank you um, for, for jumping on the interview. I do have one more question for you, and then we'll, then we'll wrap up. So we've been going for a while. But uh, is there anything about yourself that you think is an important part of who you are that I did not ask you about today? In other words, what did I miss? Mm, I, I don't really think you missed anything, but I would say one of the most important things about me is just that I've been resilient. I've been through a lot in terms of like trying things and falling on my face like over and over and over again. Like I've been pursuing like the whole entrepreneurship thing since I was about 15, 16 and being resilient, getting back up after things have happened has been like very, very important. I mean, sometimes it, it takes like, five to eight years to really have a really, really big breakthrough. Like on, on average for someone to become super, super successful, it's eight to 10 years. Like, you know, people get mild success in two to four to six years, but on average people that are great actors or great businessmen or own companies, great CEOs or just great entrepreneurs in general <clears throat> took them eight to 10 years from the time they started started learning about stuff to the time that they got to where they were going to, to really to really get good at it and have that company built up or have that career built up or have that client list built up or the services and everything. So I think resilience is, and like again, I don't think that you missed it. I don't think there's anything that you missed, but I think I would say resilience, getting back up, bouncing back, that sort of thing. That's awesome. That's fantastic. So, you know, again, I, I want to thank you, Jordan, for, for coming on. And uh, in doing this interview, I think you provided a lot of value uh, to, to everybody, myself and, and everybody that's listening. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, again, everybody, go check out Jordan's book and course. I'm, again, going to put the link down in, de in the description below. So go check that out. Um, but I do want to take a moment to thank everybody that's listening. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this a lot lately, but, but y'all are the reason that, um, that we do this. Y'all are the reason that this is this is so meaningful and this is so worth it to me. Um, I love doing this and I will continue doing this. Um, and hopefully the things that we talk about in this podcast, in this show, provide value to you. And you can take something from it. And, and in, in any way, you can become a little bit better from having been a part of this process. So I do want to thank you so much for listening. Uh, it, uh, today's been another Project Egg interview, and we've been talking to Jordan Miller from North Carolina. Take care now.